Hey everybody, welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, the podcast where size matters. My name is Terry Battisti. And I'm Ken Duke. Our producer and engineer is the fabulous, the amazing, the voice of his generation, Nathan Lloyd Benson. And in this episode of the Big Bass Podcast, we are going to take a look at what is the, uh, I believe it's the fourth biggest state record in the country, Terry, and that is Mississippi. Yep. We've got a special guest to dig into that, a lifelong Mississippian and a great, very close friend of ours named Iron Mike or Spooky Mike, as you'll see from uh, his handle here on the show, Spooky Mike Davis, who is also the premier bass detective out there. Mike works for the uh, the state of Mississippi as an investigator. And uh, if you want to find somebody, if you want to track somebody down, he's your man. And if you're hiding, you don't want to be, you don't want to have him on your tail. Welcome, Mike Davis. Hey, Mike, what's up? Thank you, Terry. How are you guys? <laughs> Good, good, good. We're doing good, man. And we've known for some time that if we were going to tackle Mississippi, we had to get Mississippi Mike on. And, and you know, Mississippi's got obviously a, a rich and storied tradition of bass fishing. But yep. in the world of big bass, Mississippi kind of really did not hit the big time until the 90s. Uh, and that was, you know, some years after Florida bass had been introduced to the state. And, and Mike, as a lifelong Mississippi guy, now in your 50s, you've got a ton Is he that of young? experience. He, well, he doesn't look it, but, you know, there you go. <laughs> you have a ton of experience in chasing big bass in the Magnolia State. And I know big bass are your passion. Correct. Correct, Ken. I uh, fell in love with largemouth bass fishing in the 70s as a, as a young kid. And... Uh, have never stopped, you know, and it's like the older I get, the, the, the more the passion and the drive is there, you know, to pursue large mouth, especially trophy large mouth. Yep. And, and Mike's got dozens of fish over 10 pounds, including several over 13. And, and, uh, we're going to get into Mike's fishing and, and where he thinks the next Mississippi record can be caught. And, and we're also going to get into the current Mississippi record of fish that was taken, uh, on December 31st of, of 1992. But first, Mike, I want to dig into a little of Mississippi state record history. And, and Terry, for that, I couldn't find anything really old. The oldest fish I could come up with, Terry, was a fish from 1962. Well, isn't that about the time that they started learning how to write and read in, in, in oh, Mississippi? Oh, <laughs> We were still fighting the war until 63, Terry. <laughs> oh, okay. That's what it was. You were, uh, you had other obligations going on. Right. I would, for the record, for the record, Spooky Mike, I would never go after Mississippi like that. Texas maybe, but not Mississippi. No, in, in October of 1960, uh, an angler by the name of Troy C. Williamson caught an 11-pound, 2-ounce bass. I have no idea where. But 11-2 put him on the board as a state record holder for a while. Uh, even though there were other published reports saying that a 9-4 was the state record. And then in 1962, in April, uh, an angler from Mobile, Alabama, uh, reported an 11-10 out of Red Gap Lake near Wiggins, Mississippi. And Mike, here's why you haven't caught the state record yet. Um, Mr. Jordan, who caught this 11-10 in, uh, in April of 62, he was using a cricket for bait and, and use it to cast it on a, a spinning combo a, a zebco 3300-6 rod and a shakespeare 1774 spinning reel and he was throwing wow. on a six pound test with a mustad brim hook and uh and here's uh here's a great quote from the uh, chief of uh, fisheries for the uh, at the time the mississippi game and fish commission he said this record is even more impressive when the tight bait and hook Mr. Jordan used are considered. Well, no, no. I'm not <laughs> dazzled when people catch giant bass on brim hooks. It's a bad look. We don't like that. Or, or size 18 treble hooks and cheese, right? A yeah, exactly. Or cheese That's bait, right, Terry? Cheese oh, bait? Exactly. <laughs> That's totally a California thing. We don't like it, especially not here in the South. Now, the 1110 <laughs> stood as the record until uh, May of 63. That's when a guy from uh, Jackson, Mississippi, named Noel Mills, caught a 13-2. And uh, he caught on his first cast of the day on a private lake just north of Jackson. And uh, he caught that fish on a blue plastic worm. So that's totally legit. I like it. Blue plastic mm -hmm. worm, we all know that back in that era, any color plastic worm was okay as long as it was blue. blue. 
Yeah. Blue. Exactly. Probably a cream, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> or, a, a, or, a, or or a yeah, back. A, a DeLong. Could or have man. been could have been a few. Man's it was too early for man's. I think man's started coming out about 67, but a blue plastic worm, gotta like it. Then a yep. year later, April 64, uh, the record is is almost tied by a 13-1, another private lake out of Jackson. This fish, guys, caught on a shyster, which uh, back when I was growing up, a shyster was a, a, a brand of inline spinner. Yep. And uh, so yet another case of a guy pan fishing and coming really close to a Mississippi state record. Mm -hmm. uh, 73, the record gets tied at 13-2. Uh, an angler named Randy Dennis out of Hattiesburg fishing a two acre pond in Forest County and throwing something he only identified as an arbogast lure. Uh, catches this 13 2, but strangely, in the same month, later in that same month, an article by the Mississippi Game and Fish Commission didn't even mention this catch. So I don't know if they found out something about it they didn't like or what, but mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Randy Dennis was not recognized by the state. Uh, February 74. Now we're getting into something cool, guys. This is one I want to dig into a little bit. Uh, Mike knows quite a bit about this catch. Uh, February 28, 1974, a, a black gentleman in his mid fifties named Lucius Gregory. He's from Starkville, Mississippi. He's fishing a farm pond. Uh, Mike, you're going to have to help me with this county name. Okatibaha, Okatiba, what is it? Okatiba. Uh, Okatiba County. A uh, six or eight acre pond in Okatiba County. Uh, he's bluegill fishing and he catches a fish, a giant bass. I'm just going to say a giant bass because uh, at the time he catches it, we really don't know how big it was. But, but you guys are going to get a kick out of this story. Uh, this story came out of the Hattiesburg American uh, some years later, 12 years after the catch. And it's a story that's being told by uh, an angler named... Uh, Oof. What is it? Um, where is this guy's name? His name is Herbie Ward, and Herbie Ward was a twenty early twenties college student uh, who happened to be he was a Mississippi State student who happened to be fishing the same pond, also fishing for bluegill, but fishing with a fly rod that day. So he was out there, and he runs into Lucius Gregory and these other guys who are fishing with spin casting gear and and jamming their rods into the dirt. To, to act as the into a crawdad holders. hole. <laughs> there you go. There you yeah. go. Probably into a crawdad hole. And uh, he's watching these guys. And just as soon as he gets there, basically, he watches this guy, Lucius Gregory, fighting this enormous bass. And uh, he says at first, you know, there's a bite. Lucius Gregory sets the hook. He's winding this bluegill in. All of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. And uh, and he's got the a much bigger fight on his hands. So I want to quote from this story quite a bit here because it, it's it's very cool and, and quite quite interesting the way it all played out. He says, Lucas was fishing on a sloping bank, tight lining for brim with Zebco reels. They had the butts stuck in the ground or maybe behind one of those little holders, he said. Uh, he said, about this time, Gregory's pole twitched at the pull of a small brim and he began to reel the fish back to the bank. Then it happened. He was reeling it in pretty easy, and all of a sudden, a little his little rod bent double. I assumed a bass came up and hit the brim. It was still pretty cold, and the initial fight was not that much. After that, he was like reeling in a boot. So uh, this guy, Lucius Gregory, pulls his fish up on the bank, and uh, Herbie Ward is watching all this transpire, and he thinks, oh my God, that's the biggest bass I've ever seen. Well, Lucius Gregory picks the fish up, unhooks it, throws it in the back of his truck. <laughs> throws it in the back of the pickup truck. Mm -hmm. According to Ward, between a, a, a spare tire and a bunch of rusty equipment. Okay, so Gregory's going to eat these fish. His only plan is to take these fish home, clean them, yep. put them in a frying pan. So, but that Herbie Ward wasn't, witnesses. wasn't cool with that. There was a lot of witnesses to this catch. Apparently totally legit catch. So, uh, Ward says to him, Hey, don't you want to put that fish on a stringer or something? You should weigh that fish. That's a, a giant. The guy says, nah, 
I'm going to take it home. I'm going to clean it. I'm going to eat it. So a uh, couple hours go by. And uh, Ward and his buddy uh, go home. It's not that comfortable a day out. It's, uh, it's kind of chilly. And it's February. So they, they decide they're going to go home. But Ward winds up telling another friend about the catch. So he and this other friend go back to the pond. And they see that Lucius Gregory and his friends are still fishing. By now, four hours have passed. And this fish is still in the back of his truck. Finally, finally, Ward convinces Gregory. He says, well, I might stop and weigh it. I might stop and weigh it. So Ward decides to follow the guy home and see if he weighs the fish. Insane. It's insane. It's insane. Mikey, there, it's, there's no word. Yeah. We've all said it. O only in Mississippi would Terry Batiste say because, you know, he's got a gripe against the Magnolia State. But, uh, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> so, but, but this guy, Lucius Gregory, is passing by every grocery store, every convenience store, every place that might have a set of scales. Certified scales, yeah. He's driving right by him. And he goes all the way to his house. And 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 does not weigh the fish at all. Um, so now Ward says, I'm getting obsessed about this fish. Uh, he, he goes and he follows the guy right to his house, pulls right in the drive. And the guy, the whole time he's telling the guy, you're making a mistake not to weigh this fish. He says, but the whole time we were talking... He got his big black kettle out and started getting the grease ready. <laughs> so, so at this point, at this point, uh, Ward and his buddy, he's got a couple of friends with him there at this point. They reach into their wallets and they, they pulled together all the cash they had, which apparently was 15 bucks. And they buy the fish. Which, it, it's it's nineteen seventy four. They got fifteen bucks on them. Come on, a lot of money. That's yeah, a which was a lot, of, a lot of money in seventy four. Oh yeah, yeah, you can buy multiple tanks of gas in nineteen seventy four yeah. money here. So so they offer him fifteen bucks for the fish, and, and he takes it. Um, so they immediately jump back in their vehicle, and, and they drive it to a, a local store, and the fish weighs thirteen eight new state record. Jeez. By this time, by this time, it is five hours after the fish has come out of the water and been in the back of Lucius Gregory's pickup truck. Easy, a 14 pound fish. Totally Easy. dehydrated. Totally dehydrated. This fish was stiff as a board, dry as a piece of toast. You know, this fish was, had to be, you know, who knows? Maybe this is a, maybe this is a 14 and a half pound fish at this point. Possibly. I know there are people who have done some studies on how much a fish will dehydrate. I don't know what the air temperature was that day. I don't know what the humidity was that day. But apparently this fish was just sitting in the back of a pickup truck with nothing on it to keep it wet. Um, so anyway, um, Ward decides, well, I'm going to have this fish mounted. This is the new state record. And then after I get this fish mounted, I'm going to give it to Lucius Gregory. I'm going to give it to the man because after all, it is his fish. Yeah. So he does that. And uh, meanwhile, there are all these rumors and stories in the going around about what this fish might be worth. Well, who hears these stories? Lucius. Lucius Gregory hears these yes. stories. <laughs> and Mike, interrupt me if you know some of this, man. But Lucius Gregory hears these stories. And so suddenly, Herbie Ward's phone starts to ring. And it's Lucius Gregory. And, and here's what Mr. Gregory said about this in, 19, uh, in 1986. He said, he wanted the fish back. And he called me all the time, day and night. I kept telling him there was nothing to the rumors. And he was right. Uh, I kept telling him there was nothing to the rumors. And when I got the fish back, he could have it. I finally told him if he kept calling me, I'd donate the bass to a museum or something. He kept calling. And I finally told him he wouldn't get the bass. <laughs> so, I bought so, it from you fair and square. I bought it from you I fair paid, and square. I paid yeah. 15 bucks. I paid to uh, have it mounted. Now, and then I learned, and, and Mike, you might want to do some investigation on this. But unfortunately, I learned this 
just before we started recording this episode. Sure. But uh, back in the sure. 80s, this fish sat for three years on the wall at the Spillway Bait and Tackle Shop in Columbus, Mississippi. Before that, it had been at outdoor shows and, and was even in the Jackson Game and Fish Commission Museum. No idea where that catch is now. No idea if anybody really cares about it because it was only the state record until uh, 1987 when uh, when it was beaten by more than a pound, uh, a fish out of Tippa County Lake uh, that weighed 1412 caught by Perry Reed. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, four years after that, in August of 91, uh, a fish that weighed uh, about 14 pounds, 15 ounces, caught by Tim Myers out of Natchez State Park lake and both of those fish were caught on plastic worms uh but man what a story lucius gregory lucius if you're still around we'd love to have you on the show but but little respect for the way you handle that fish sir little respect yeah. well number one I'm, I, I'm gonna have to dig into that story a little bit on lucius because i have a question for him and i think terry will respect this and appreciate this question did he tie it down you know, did he tie it down? <laughs> yeah. Was he related to Fritz Freeball, you know? <laughs> he threw it in the back of the truck for what you say, five hours? Five yeah. hours oh in the back God. of the truck. Five hours. Yeah. Oh, another cool thing, guys. And when I'd been re I, I'm constantly in the process of researching these stories, but uh I had this in my folder for Mississippi. Uh the story about about Herbie Ward I pulled from uh the Hattiesburg American, April 27, 1986. But I also had this from the May, June, 1974 issue of Bassmaster Magazine. If you yeah. got Bassmaster back in the day, uh, you remember a segment called Mail Call where people would send in letters. And here's back. a letter from Herbie Reed right after that <laughs> fish was caught telling the story, probably in full form, but back then Bob Cobb would have cut it down to make it yeah. uh, fit the magazine. Exactly. But well, yeah, Mike, Mike, I mean, Mike, you've got to be able to find that fish. I mean, that's just right yeah. down in your area, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm a couple hours from Columbus, but I do get up there semi-frequently. And I've mm -hmm. been in that that tackle shop. I think you said Spillway Tackle Shop. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, exactly. I so it's, it's still around. I it cannot recall that. And it's, it's been a few years since I've been in that shop, but... I cannot yeah. recall that specific fish, but to back up to your earlier comments, Ken, about uh, Mr. Dennis in Forest County catching a fish, big fish, state record fish on a Arbogast lure. I'm somewhat familiar with that story, and to my recollection, that was a black jitterbug. Black jitterbug, there you go. I have there no evidence to back that up. It's just years of rumors and stories, but I may yeah. dig into that one as well also. Cool. Yeah, the only published report I could find on that fish, or uh, perhaps a better statement is every published report I could find on that fish reported it just as an arbogaster lure, which basically tells well, me... Well, an arbogast, but there's an arbogaster. There was the arbogaster. That. I understand that, and that may have been correct, but, um, but who knows? You get... You get these reports out there and sometimes the references are, are very vague and you know the names are wrong uh because arbogast was both a brand and a specific bait and they didn't specify anything about a manufacturer in the story i'm a little bit skeptical about it being an actual arbogast but it certainly could have been right but right. but mike obviously the way you're going wrong my friend and i say this to you in in total friendship and in interest of your catching a world re state record one day I'm, I'm holding the world record for myself um, obviously you need to be bluegill fishing. Oh, correct. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I grew up in that era in the, in the seventies, which I'm, I'm a product of the sixties, uh, much as our, our friend, Dr. Batisti. I just, I just do not possess the hit, the hippie profile as much, but I, uh, I'm, I'm a product of the sixties and I grew up in that seventies and eighties era bass fishing. And most of the serious big bass anglers in Mississippi during that time, and, and still somewhat today, their number one go-to lure is a live bluegill. And the bigger the bluegill, the bigger the bass those guys produce. Uh, I know multiple state fisheries 
uh, that are managed and known by the state game and fish commission in the state of Mississippi that had produced, you know, 14, 15, 16 pound plus fish. And most always those, those fish are, are called off live bluegill. Wow. Still today. Yeah. And that's obviously a great bait choice. Anytime you go natural and you go on the large end of, of natural forage in your area, you're probably increasing your chances of catching a giant bass exponentially. Uh, sure, I think it's fair definitely. to say exponentially you're increasing your chances. But Mike, one of the things we wanted to bring you on this particular show for, not, not simply because it's a Mississippi show, but because uh, of your uh, knowledge, your encyclopedic knowledge about the fish that broke that August 1991 record set by Tim Myers at Natchez State Park Lake. That, that record did not last very long. And uh, we're excited to have you on to talk about the man who, who broke that record in uh, December of 92. And that's Anthony Denny. And, and, and the first thing that I want to go into here is there have been a lot of conflicting reports about the weight of the Anthony Denny fish. Uh, I've seen published reports saying that fish weighed 18.15 pounds, which would be about yeah. a little less than 18 pounds, three ounces. And I've yeah. seen reports that that fish weighed 18 pounds, 15 ounces. So just That's a, a tiny shade. There's a massive, <laughs> right. yeah, there's three quarters of a pound difference there. And yeah. you know the truth because you run in that circle of state officials who have that information. Yeah. Yeah, correct, Ken. Uh, and, and, and back in that era, I was I was fishing that particular bottle body of water as often as I could, although it's approximately a three hour drive west of my home, and uh, you know it's it, it's hard to make that drive to fish for one or two days and, and run back when you're working a, a full time job. But I remember when Anthony caught that fish, there was there was a little bit of discrepancy through different publications. It was 18.15 or 18 slash 15, you know. Yep. We're talking tenths, hundreds, or we're talking ounces, you know. And yep. it, it wasn't very long ago I had a conversation with the uh, fisheries director at Mississippi Game and Fish, Mr. Dennis Rickey, and he gave me the lowdown. He was there. He was a, a witness to the certification. Uh and, and actually uh, helped Anthony fill out his application for a, a state record. And he said, no, there, there was no shadow of a doubt. I was there. I witnessed it along with multiple other guys. It was 18.15 pounds, you know. Okay, so a little bit on the, the smaller 15. end of that. Yeah, 18.15. So, yeah. but still a, a gigantic fish. And hey, yeah. that is the, the fourth sure. biggest state record in the country. Right. And we're going to, of course, we're going to have some pictures of Anthony Denny with with his fish there. And, and you know, one of the things I, I love about the Anthony Denny story is this guy was serious about big bass yeah. chasing. This is yeah, not Lucius hard. Gregory who yeah, stumbled onto hard a giant. He was hard in the back of the truck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no offense to Lucius Gregory or anybody who happens to be a, a, a bluegill angler, but I, I like seeing the guys be rewarded for having you know having targeted a fish like that yeah. a world a truly a world-class fish at 18.15 that is right. a world-class fish so yeah, and, so what was what was denny's history for big fish had he caught a lot of big fish in his in his life or do you know any of that mike he he had uh anthony and i'll back up a little bit of history here and dovetail into the the current conversation we're having here is mm -hmm. uh i did not know anthony personally like i said i'm in central mississippi he was in southwestern mississippi in natchez but my brother actually worked with anthony for quite a while and oh, wow. they, they they knew each other other fairly well and and swapped big bass theories and conversations back and forth and anthony was a hunting and fishing guide predominantly for a large portion of his life across mm -hmm. the river from Natchez over around Faraday and uh, that region of Louisiana. And he targeted big bass quite often. And this particular 
winter of, uh, you know, 92, the stars lined up perfectly. We got unusually warm weather moved into the area. Multiple days of, of temperatures in the high 70s to 80s is, is by all counts, according to Anthony and, and the Game and Fish. Excuse me. And he realized this was a great opportunity to stop deer hunting and go pursue this particular fish. Oh, so he had that fish staked out, or not staked out, but he knew of that that particular fish. Correct. Correct. Wow. Now, one of the things that's always amazed me about truly world-class fish, fish of 18 pounds and up, is they're almost exclusively caught in the first half of the year. And Anthony Denny's catch is one of very, very, very few exceptions, but it was caught on December 31st, so just one day out from being the first catch of the year and and mr denny was uh was just 29 years old when he caught the fish almost 30. um wow. you, you mentioned that yeah. your uh your your brother knew him and you know the officials out there yeah. at the lake what can you tell us about the catch why did he why did he make a point to be out there that day um what was his fishing method well let me back up a second uh, before I answer some of that, Ken, like I said a few minutes ago, the temperatures were very, very warm that week. Uh, right. To the best of my memory, he caught the fish on, I, I know it was December the 31st, and I believe that was on a Thursday. Three, three and four days prior, temperatures were seasonally warm, and he said, hey, this is a great opportunity to go chase this fish. Now, to back up, and reference that fish, this fish that he was pursuing was shocked up in March of the same year and tagged by fisheries biologists. And Anthony was there on the lake that day and witnessed the fish being shocked up and tagged, at which time she weighed, I believe, if I'm, if I'm, I believe she weighed a little over 16 pounds, 16 and a quarter pounds. And she was tagged within 100 yards of the of the boat ramp at the lake. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, we're not talking about Ross Barnett, Sardis, Enid, or, or a huge reservoir. <laughs> we're talking about, you know, approximately a 235 to 240 acre lake. So there's only one boat ramp. And he was fishing that particular area that day. Uh, well, that morning. And... Just by coincidence, the park ranger, Mr. Roddy Powell, was fishing approximately 100 yards away from him. I spoke with Roddy, interviewed Roddy. He, he, he tells me the same story. He said uh, Anthony was fishing a rattling rogue. I believe it was blue back, uh, silver half, silver belly, so, you know, from the halfway Chrome. down was, was yeah, Chrome yeah, blue right. yeah, and hooked the fish. And when he hooked her, he yelled out at Roddy, I think I've got her, referring to wow. the fish that those guys witnessed being tagged in March. Yeah, now speaking with Anthony's daughter, Deanna Denny, who still lives in Natchez, Mississippi, she told me verbatim what her dad had told her two days prior he believes he hung the same bass the same fish and she shook off she come up and shook off so he saw the weather lining up perfectly everything yeah. was lining up and instead of deer hunting that day because it was so hot here in mississippi he said i'm going to the lake and pursue that fish and as it worked out he hung the fish. Roddy witnessed it. Roddy did tell me that when he hung the fish, she immediately went down into coontail moss, which was extremely prevalent in the lake at that time. Uh, there was coontail wow. moss in the lake at that time. It was very, very thick. And she did not put up a, a great fight, as you would expect, you know, not one of these old timer 30 minute fights, you know, it was, it was a very short fight. Roddy started sculling his John boat over to her 
because they were both fishing out of a uh, park rental boats. And he was going over to him and he said, he got, before he got to him approximately, I think 30, 40 yards away, she come up and splashed a little bit in the moss. And Anthony saw the tag and he said, there she is. I've got her. And Roddy witnessed Anthony lifting up the fish full of cabbage, you know, and salad. And he, wow. he, he pulled all the cabbage off of her and says, gosh, Denny, what a bass. I believe you've got her, you know, you, you've got her. Yeah. And, you know, the certification started from right there. And the fish was Damn. x-rayed and all that stuff. So totally legit. Uh, yeah. What we haven't said out loud, but what is impressive and it happens more often than maybe a lot of people think uh anthony denny anthony denny was fishing from the bank wasn't he no no, no. He, he was not he had rented okay. he had rented uh to the best of my knowledge and uh, according to uh park ranger mr roddy Pye, he had rented one of the park's john boats that gotcha. day and okay, was, I, was i'm using mistaken it. on that i i didn't realize that um yeah. And, and he, but th this fish struck apparently in just a couple of feet of water. And, and unless you weight uh, a rattling rogue down, it's not going to get very far. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and you know, one, one thing I've kind of found amazing about the story and you guys may as well, may as well. Um, Roddy told me that the fish was shocked up and tagged less than 100 yards from where Anthony caught the fish. Yeah. And we're talking March to December. <laughs> you know, so apparently uh, yeah. she loves well, it. I mean, it's only a 240 acre lake, right? You know, right. so. Right. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, I, I've seen fish at Casitas, big fish at Casitas, year after year spawn in the same area. They may live in a different area the rest of the year, but they always seem to go back to a a certain area to spawn and mm -hmm. that might be what it was you know you have march uh right. in not when it was you know first tagged in march of 92 you know that's the end of the spawn season for you guys right um yeah uh, terry it, like this year we, we had such a mild winter uh, yeah you know uh, 22 23 winter i was actually catching spawning fish in south mississippi um hancock harrison counties pearl river counties right on the border of the gulf of mexico in late january this year <laughs> you know, yeah yeah we all know the like, big fish those big fish are the first ones to spawn right 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 so yeah i don't know and yet yeah, that fish but, uh, assuming that fish was shocked up post spawn at 16 and a quarter and yeah. then uh, and then caught in the last day of december at 18.15 that's still almost a two pound gain. That's a, that's a lot of weight to come on that fish. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great, and, you know, great growth if, rate. At that time period. And, and I was fishing that particular lake uh, as, as much as possible in that era. And there was a lot of bait fish, a lot of shad, a lot of, a lot of bluegill, a lot of crappie yeah. and a lot of coontail moss. So it, it was the perfect environment. You know, everything lined yeah. up real great for those fish. It, there was almost like steroids for them, you know, or right. in California, you know, vitamin T. Vitamin T. Yeah, yeah vitamin but, but Stephen, Stephen Barden says that a female largemouth at the time of spawn, 10% of its weight is egg mass. And so if you have an 18 pound fish, that's 1.8 pounds of eggs. That's almost two pounds of eggs, which takes you down to 16 pounds, mm -hmm. right? So that fish could have been 18 pounds in March when it was shocked. It's just that it had gotten rid of its eggs. You put a, and, you, and you have five or six blue, months worth of eating bluegill and shad, adding some more weight. I mean, yeah, it's. Mm -hmm. Totally plausible. And, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, Terry. And but one of the guys I spoke with that that was there that day when she was shocked up in March said that she had no eggs. She, yeah. she her, 
she, you know, she was flat stomach. She had spawned out in probably February. They shocked her up in March and she was starting to rebuild her body weight. You know, I wasn't mm -hmm. there. I can't testify to that, but you know, no. that's, that's more than likely for that area of the state, you know? Yeah. You know, we, we obviously have learned the stories now about Anthony Denny and his 18.15, uh, we know that the previous record had come out of the same body of water just a, a few months earlier, or well, a little more than a year earlier. Uh, what about some other giants out of there? Mike was was Natchez State Park Lake churning out the giants in the early nineties. There was quite a few, to my <clears throat> knowledge, Ken. Uh, and, and you know, it, it was much much like any other big bass factory, uh, especially the. In the West Coast, Terry. <clears throat> you know, uh, the guys that were catching, the guys that were catching a lot of those big fish weren't talking about them. You know, and I know several guys that caught fish over thirteen and fourteen that that wouldn't talk about it. You know, and and, and you're talking about an era also that every big fish caught that a guy was really proud of. It was going to a taxiderma shop for a skin mount. You know, yeah. And if you live in three and four hours away, none of the locals are going to know about it. You know, unless, unless right. because there there was no social media, no cell phones, and, and guys kept their mouth shut. You know. Yeah. But still, two state records in a row that had to put a lot of pressure on a two hundred and thirty or forty acre lake. Oh, it did. I it did. I remember I fished that lake. I think two months after Anthony Denny caught that fish. And the best of my can remember, Ken, I had to park 300 yards or so away from the boat ramp, you know, to get there. 300 yards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have exactly. launch ramps that are 300 yards long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh. There, there was a lot of pressure come up on the lake. But to defend the lake on this degree, I, I really think the lake is starting to come back. It was uh, recently restocked a few years back with Florida largemouth, and fishing pressure has been down, as you can imagine. And uh, I, I think we may see see good good signs coming from that lake again soon in the next couple of years. So, so do you think that the trophy fishermen killed the lake, or did the lake just go into a, a downward spiral? you know, after that due to environmental conditions or what? I, I really think, Terry, that I don't think – I think maybe it got a, a little too much pressure or maybe a yeah. lot – you know, that's a small lake, you know. Yeah. And I think it may have been a combination of things at the time, pressure, and it was starting to go in that down downhill slide, as all lakes do, you know, all, right. all lakes – cycle you know yeah and uh i was there the last time i was there i believe was a year and a half ago in dreaded hot mississippi july temperatures and uh i caught two fish over eight pounds one afternoon and uh, i witnessed a guy catch a, a fish over nine pounds and uh there was only four boats on the water that afternoon you know Wow. And, and and two of the boats were crappie fishing. So I, I think it's got a lot of potential to come back strong in the next couple of years, especially after a restocking. And, you know, you yeah. guys know how uh, restocking with Florida's are. That first generation, six, eight years later, will produce some, some really nice trophy class fish, you know. Right. How deep is the lake? What's the deepest part of the lake? Terry, it's hard for me to remember the the best I can because I, I typically always fish the shallow coves and up in the shade line, but the best I can remember, it, it does have some 24, 26 feet water in it with a couple of creek channels and mm -hmm. uh, uh, quite a bit of timber, you know, stumps and, and flooded timber up in it, especially back in the era when Anthony caught his fish, you know, it was still mm -hmm. relatively new. And it, it yeah. had quite a bit of standing timber, but now it's it's predominantly stumps and you know submerged logs, and a lot of heavy 
uh, shoreline shaded cover. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Mike, in, in researching the Mississippi record, I learned that Florida bass were were not new to Mississippi when they started putting them in in Natchez State Park Lake. They had been stocking them and trying to get something going with them, beginning in the early '70s, but they were not getting the kind of results they wanted. I'm not I'm not sure why, but um, but obviously with Natchez State Park Lake, they they hit a home run. A lot of big fish came out of there. Was that how it was kind of introduced to the public? They said, okay, this is going to be our our signature big fish lake in the state? To my knowledge, Ken, it, it somewhat it was. Uh, you know, Mississippi Game and Fish Department started introducing Florida's in Mississippi in 1975. And one of the locations, I looked here at my notes, one of the locations that they introduced those fish was the Paspagula River. And Paspagula River is never ever been well known for trophy fish you know two to four pounders are giants you know wow the, yeah seems like and, a, a uh, mistake to waste of fish yeah. Yeah. yeah you know uh lake whittington is is a very great fishery up off the mississippi river in northwestern mississippi uh matter of fact i think your buddy and our buddy bill dance has, has filmed numerous shows back in later year, early years on Lake Whittington and, and tell some great stories of fishing in Lake Whittington. But I don't think the Floridas have really taken off there as they have in uh, Ross Barnett Reservoir, Grenada, or, or Natchez. And they also was stocking uh, Floridas in 1975 in Grenada Reservoir with not a lot, a lot of success back in that era, you know. Mm -hmm. So that first introduction of Florida's did not seem to take off as well as they did when we started trying it in the 1980s. All right, Mike, I want to change gears a little bit with you here. Terry and I, uh, we know what a serious big bass chaser you are. And uh, yeah. Terry and I have, have, we both have big money on you in Vegas to catch the next state record. And it's hard to find the line on that, but if you go to the right casino, you can, right sports betting center, you can get that. And I think you're at two to one. Uh, so we put basically everything we have on you to break eight the bucks. state record. I put eight bucks on you. He put eight. I put ten. That's because I love you more. Uh, <laughs> Your life savings, right? <laughs> that's all I got, man. That's all I got. Um, but uh, that's actually twice what we've made doing the Big Bass Podcast. So that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, what? Uh, but but as as a guy who's you know it's 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 more than just a, a dream for some guys to break their state record and, and a guy like Mike Davis, who, who focuses on big fish like that, where do you think is the best chance for somebody to catch a state record in Mississippi these days? I'll be surprised if he answers it. <laughs> I'll be surprised if he says a public body of water. Yeah. I'll be surprised yeah. if he names any body of water at all. Exactly. Name. He look at it. Look, he's pursed his lips. He ain't going to say anything. <laughs> the show is over folks. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Big Bass. Podcast. <laughs> yeah. I can only reveal that information to the songbird of, of our generation, Mr. Nathan Benson. <laughs> Nathan, it would be at, yeah, it would be in the northwestern quadrant of the Bermuda Triangle and sector sector six of the Black Forest. Okay, <laughs> there. Okay, there. Seriously, there are multiple multiple landowners and, and property owners here in Mississippi that are trying to produce a late record, a state record. And Ken, I know uh, you had a friend of yours. I think he's moved out of Mississippi into Florida now. Uh, well, he's, he's actually a gentleman we're hoping to have on the big bass podcast here pretty soon. I believe you're talking about Porter yeah. Hall. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. Correct. Porter Hall for anybody who's read the book, Sal Belly, terrific book by, by Monty Burke. Yeah, uh, that yep. came out in around 2004 or five, Third, somewhere yeah. in there. Um, uh, there's a chapter on Porter Hall, who was a Floridian, I think, by birth, but who also went out chasing giants in California and caught one over, at least one over 18. And yep. then in Mississippi, he was trying to grow a world record. That didn't work out. But now I believe he's back in Florida. Uh, 
marketing shiner hooks and, and still serious about his big bass fishing. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, there. I know you don't do a lot of live bait fishing, but does it would it mean that much more to you to catch the record on an artificial or or would it just mean more to catch the state record rather? Per personally, it would. Personally, just it, you know, artificial lure. Yeah, that, the the main me. thing is Mike doesn't like his fingers getting slimy. No, he's he's very <laughs> delicate. <laughs> he's very yeah. particular. Well, I you know I'll, I'll punch a shark in the nose, but you know I, I don't want to <laughs> handle a, a four pound bluegill. You know, if you think a, a four pound bluegill is is big, Terry, you all see the cricket I caught it on. You know, yeah. <laughs> but, look uh, more like a now. turkey. <laughs> now, now these guys, let's go ahead. I'm predominantly a an artificial uh, angler. Always well, happening. You, I see you signed on to the podcast as Spooky Mike, and I know that's because you love throwing a Zara Spook so much. That's correct. That's correct. Is, is that is that? I know it's one of your go-to baits for big fish. What else do you like in Mississippi? For big fish, uh, which I typically am, am, am targeting, uh, you know, a fish over six, eight pounds and above, uh, three-quarter one-ounce spinner baits, uh, three-quarter to one-ounce jigs. Uh, as you said, a uh, sour spook. Uh, the big pop bars, I like those a lot. And Terry, he's hating that I'm asking him these questions. Yeah, you're, you're yeah. killing. Me. He hasn't mentioned and, swim bait yet. He hasn't <laughs> mentioned, you know. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't check your mailbox tomorrow morning because something may be ticking in your mailbox. Yeah, he hasn't mentioned crickets yet, so I know he's not telling us everything. Right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, live crappie. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Two two pound and above crappie. Well, but, what uh, what's your what's your Mississippi personal best? Thirteen two. Thirteen two. That's a beast. That's, That's a, a beast fish. of a fish. Yeah. Most people will never most people will never come close to that despite trying really hard for a long time. Now you mentioned private water in Mississippi. Are are there a number of landowners who are importing Florida bass to to grow giants? Sure. sure. Yes. All almost every one of the every landowner here, uh that are growing bass yeah, are all stocking and, and growing for a large mile. Yes. Now, are they allowing the public to fish these lakes or are these lakes that they don't allow anybody except Mike spooky Mike to fish? No, you know, predominantly no Terry. And I will make sure you <laughs> never get an invitation to any of these lakes. <laughs> but uh, That's only fair. He's not, it's not going to be good if he's out there. Yeah. You know, no one can trust Terry. He talks too much, you know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, aye, I, aye, aye. Insane, so insanely, weird. insanely talks too much, you know. Holy he talks too much. And then every, every other word is insane. So, yeah. What are you getting? But, uh, uh, you know, for most of these, these, these landowners that are, that have built these private ponds and lakes have stocked for a large amount. Uh, even a few guys have stocked. Uh, strictly spotted bass with the, uh, you know, I'm hearing this, about that. Yeah. I'm hearing about that. That's very interesting to me that uh, guys are doing that because well, I, I tend to think of, of a spotted bass as a big water fish, yeah. not a fish that is uh, going to be caught in a, a pond. And I tend to think of them as uh, a rocky substrate fish. Yep. Uh, and that's not your typical pond situation uh our friend eric mayo who works with cliff pace at his bait company yeah. he's targeting a state record spot and uh, i hope he gets it um yeah. and i want to see spooky mike davis get the state record largemouth 30 years though now mike more than 30 years what the hell when 31. are you guys gonna when are you guys gonna break this well I'll be honest with you ken i i almost believe that our state record is, is, is much like yours in Florida and in the California and, and our overall world record. We we've set the bar pretty high, you know, and the stars are going to have to, and right now, most of Mississippi has been in a 
severe drought. You know, uh, my personal pond out in the front yard here, my, my test tank where I, I test lures I build and, and play with is over four and a half foot low right now. Wow. Um, yeah. And I, I went wade fishing two weeks ago on a, on a river near home here and I never got to wade. You know, I, I walked two miles one way and two miles back to the truck on the opposite side and I never got wet. And it, well, I would typically be up to my waist in water, you know, and we're under severe drought. Times are changing. But you know what's happening with all that low water? Willows are growing. The grass is growing. So when we start getting some rainfall, we're going to start getting almost like a new lake effect. And yep. next year could be really awesome. There's there's multiple lakes uh, here in the state that have, do have potential. You know, um, I believe it was just, I think it was 2016, 2017. Ken, you may know better than I. Mr. Jeff Foster caught a 17 plus pound up at Lake Davis, which Lake Davis is within the Tom Bigby National Forest up in, uh, I believe, at uh, Monroe County, I believe it is. And that that's a huge fish, you know, and it was. Enormous. Yeah, that, that's Enormous. a real. And, and that lake has produced several fish in the teens in the last several years, which once again, a, a lot of it's not publicized because these guys are like, you know, keep it quiet or, or we're going to yeah. get bombarded with outsiders. So, you know, it's just like Terry's uh, conversation a, a few shows ago in California. Guys that are catching a lot of these giant bats aren't talking about them very much. Not saying it, not saying a word about them. Right. Okay. If, if Mike Davis catches an 18, three or so ounces off the state record, will anybody hear about it? It will probably go out on the news wire faster than the day that we invaded Iraq. You know, everyone, <laughs> every, especially you two clowns will know about it within 30 seconds just because I can. Yeah, I can FaceTime you or text you and say, hey, guys, look at this one. You know, look what she did. Yeah. But, that is awesome. Uh, that is, yeah, we want not, to know about it. Not, not that I would rub it in your face. I just want you guys to share in the memories and the laughs of it, you know. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. And now, what, so if you caught it, you'd uh, weigh it, you'd certify it, you would uh, measure it, length and girth. Yeah. Would you put it back in a lake? Sure. Yeah. Sure. And sure. not tell anybody it, where that lake it, was. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, per, personally, and I, I may be wrong about this, and, and I know it, to each his own, and I may get stoned in the morning when I walk out my door, but I think it would depend, Terry, upon the impoundment, which on what which lake it was. If it was a 50-acre lake, I may not make it so public because I wouldn't want to do the fishery and injustice versus 33. Or the property <laughs> owner. <laughs> yeah. Well, or, or a property owner. I was invited to fish his ponds, you know, Yeah. Uh, versus 33,000 acre Ross Barnett reservoir. It's 40 minutes up the road here. That yeah. would be a difference or which Ross Barnett gets enough pressure as it is. There's probably nine tournaments going on there tonight, you know? Yeah. But uh, yep. I think it would depend on the impoundment, which lake it was. So yep. uh, speaking of Mike walking out his front door, as he said, folks, the background there is not a green screen. That is Mike's living room. Uh, and, and it's the envy of every uh, outdoors lover I know. Well, he lives in the Bass Pro Shops. <laughs> Terry is in his garage with makeup boxes behind him. I'm in my cluttered a horrible little hole of an office but mike has got it going on in that in that living room yeah but ken there uh, you and terry both there's multiple items in your office and terry's garage that could possibly that be good. Kind of possibly your, uh... be taken away when you guys go off on another adventure <laughs> somewhere you know <laughs> well he's I'm gonna lift that... he's gonna live stuff man I'm hoping that uh, one of the I things I, I know I got, Terry. 
I'm hoping that one of the things I gave you recently is going to find a place of honor somewhere in that living room. She's actually at the taxidermist shop getting some touch up paint as we I speak. wasn't even talking about that one. I forgot about that one. Yeah, but folks, I gave I gave uh, Mike a, a replica of the George Perry world record largemouth. Yeah. I was talking about another thing. I was talking mm. about the uh the handwritten outline. Oh we we can't discuss well, I that. guess I guess we can't discuss that now. No, that, that all right, fair enough. That's I've I've got that in the back room, the hidden room, you know, buried in the uh the Ark of the Covenant, you know, that that's yeah, a super secretive outline of the Bill Dance Bob Cobb book. There he is. Yeah. <laughs> that Ken nope. Duke went dumpster diving for. And what year was that, Ken? You went dumpster diving? I did not go dumpster diving. I found it. What it is, folks, is uh, if anybody has the 1973 book by Bill Dance, it's called uh, There He Is, Bill Dance on the Art of Worm Fishing. Um, I happen to have the handwritten outline in Bill Dance's own handwriting and Ray Cobb, uh, sorry, Bob Cobb's own handwriting, um, where they outlined how they were going to present the book. And uh, I, I gave that to Mike because I got nowhere to put it. And I, I wanted to get it in the hands of somebody who would really care about it and, and treat it right. But don't don't even think about raiding Mike's home for it because I'm pretty sure the house is booby trapped and it would not go well for you. <laughs> no. So booby trapped. That's the reason they call him little boom. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. another thing. Hey folks don't know this, but uh, <laughs> hey, these are my buddies Big Boom and Little Boom. Uh Terry at six <laughs> three is is Big Boom. Uh Mike at less slightly less than six three is Little Boom. But it's it's more because of the the work they do, and and they are both very dangerous people. You don't want to tamper with them. I'm just Ken. <laughs> they have nicknames, not me. Uh, yeah, but you know, you know, it's possible that we could be hired out for money or permission to fish certain lakes. You know, just just give true. us a call. And we'll work out something, right, Terry? Yeah, we could we could make a much bigger lake than what you currently have with our capabilities <laughs> true, true, that's true. right I we could move that. a lot of dirt we could move a lot of dirt really quickly <laughs> yeah uh, the the lengths that these guys will go to catch big fish is kind of frightening folks and it involves uh major federal expenditures at times so uh <laughs> we do our well, best so there's a question i had for mike is so your the lake out in your front yard uh, is it reliant solely on water from rain or is yes, it spring fed yes. or it, yeah, it, it, it it's not a lake. Uh, it, it's just a small farm pond I've have here in my lake. It was built in nineteen uh built in nineteen thirty-eight with mules and slips. My grandfather built it and wow. uh, we worked on worked on this farm all our lives and when it no longer existed as a farm, I, I built this castle here that Ken wants, you know, I actually got Ken a spare bedroom upstairs. You know, he, he seems to like it so much. So. You strategically put it upstairs because he can't walk upstairs, right? Cause, yeah. Well, Cause he knows, <laughs> he knows my balance is bad and too many, too many back and neck surgeries. Great. Thanks, Mike. But uh, Yeah. That, 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 my little pond slash test tank is about an acre and a half at full pool. And like I said, mm -hmm. we're, we're in such a drought phase right now it's probably down four foot or so so how deep is it if it's down four feet there can't be much water left in it no not very much at all it, there's probably three and a half foot four feet of water left in it Ooh, oh dang deep. yeah it's it's very you have very a fish deep. kill or any fish not kill yet. or not yet okay no not um, yet. that's that's pretty amazing that's good and if they can winter yeah. in that that's pretty amazing too uh, not yeah. that it gets terribly cold where you are. Well, hey, uh, guys, just to bring it back real quick to Anthony Denny and the state uh, record largemouth for Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Denny passed away uh, just last year uh, in yeah. July of 2022. And uh, he he did not have the, uh, the greatest end of life. He had his demons uh, and, and passed away, we said, last year at the age of, of just, uh, just uh, about, what, 59, I guess. He'd have been about 59. I believe and, that's um, right, Ken. He was born, I believe it was July 18th of 65. I think he was born in 63. I'm not 100 percent sure, okay. but he was he was not quite not not yet 60 years old. Um a shame, 
we'd love to be yeah. able to talk with him about this too. And as you say, uh, your late brother uh, worked with Anthony Denny, so you had a little bit right. of insight into into who he was. His daughter, um, his daughter is with us, of course. And and where is that mount for anybody who wants to see the uh, mount of the Mississippi State record? That mount is currently in a sporting goods store in Natchez, Mississippi. And the name of the store slips my memory uh, at the moment. I, I believe it's Southern Sports or Southern Sportsman in Natchez, Mississippi. Um, it's well, still, on, still on display there. Yeah, what I'd love to see happen with something like that, you know, I would love to see, uh, I would love to see some replicas made of that fish because yeah. it is the fourth biggest state record in the country. And, yeah. and it'd be great if there were some replicas done of that fish so that they could be at key locations like uh, game and fish offices around the state, maybe a museum or two, certainly somewhere, uh, certainly somewhere on the premises of, of Natchez State Park. I, I think that would be a, a great thing to have happen. So I don't know if there's any effort to get that done, but, but yeah. I think that would be a, the greatest possible purpose for a fish and for the legacy uh, of the angler anthony denny yeah that's uh, that it's it's interesting you brought that up ken because in in multiple multiple conversations with anthony's denny's daughter uh, diana she's uh expressed that to me multiple times that her dad that and that's one reason the fish is there at that sporting goods store in natchez right now it was her dad's wishes that kids and, and youngsters could see that fish and see what they could possibly catch yep. and what Mississippi has to offer in the, in, in the form of, of fishing. So it, it's been on public display for a long, long time. And uh, Deanna and I have, have spoke and, and I'm speaking with some officials at Mississippi game and fish office now to have a, several replicas made to be displayed in Mississippi museums, you know, Mississippi game and fish museums throughout the state. We're, That's great. We're, yeah. I'm glad to hear that because uh, I think uh, a fish like that needs multiple replicas so you can show it off. Recognition. That, it needs recognition. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and it, it's a tribute to the memory of the man and the more people who can see that fish. And I know that Natchez state park, I think is very close to the Louisiana state line. And so yeah. it's it's not accessible to a lot of folks in the state of Mississippi right now. Yeah, it's, it's just basically a stone's throw across the Mississippi River into Louisiana. Yeah. And like I said earlier, it's in the southwestern portion of the state. And, and let's just say you're living outside of Memphis around Tunica or South Haven, Mississippi. You, you've got to basically drive the length of the whole state to get there, you know. So, right, yeah. Uh, it's, it's probably a four and a half, five hour drive from the Dang. northern part of Mississippi just, just to get to that region. And, yeah. uh, you know, Anthony was an interesting guy from, from all accounts that I have of him, from conversations with my brother and uh, in conversations with some friends of, of his and his daughter, Deanna. And uh, he was a very interesting guy. And, there was somewhat of a mystery there for approximately a year that to his daughter's knowledge, he was MIA, you know, he, he was kind of missing in action and uh, he developed dementia early in life, uh, Alzheimer's early dementia, early Alzheimer's. And she had zero contact with him for almost a year. Wow. It had no idea where her dad was, you know, and she's a grown, she's a grown woman at this time. Her dad is, is MIA. And it, it was very, very interesting to me to see how the developments that she found her dad worked out. Um, she received a phone call one day and it was a nurse from a nursing home. I think it was a registered nurse from a nursing home in Hammond, Louisiana, called her up and uh, said, Hey, I'm, I'm nurse X, you know, nurse so-and-so. And are you Deanna Denny? She said, yes, I am. Uh, is Anthony Denny 
do you know an Anthony Denny or is he your dad? And she's like, oh, my gosh, yeah, yeah. You know, where is he? What, what What's going on? Been missing my dad for almost a year. And it was just, to me personally, it was, it was a very interesting story. Uh, yeah. Basically, wow. the nurse walks in a room one day in, in, in Anthony's room, and he's a patient there in the facility, and he has a fishing show on, on the wall. You know, I think I think she said it was Bill Dance was on the television. And the nurse walks in and says, hey, Anthony, how are you doing today? And he said, I'm, I think I'm having a pretty good day. You know, he said, I'm, I'm sitting here watching Bill Dance. And she knew immediately when he said that's bill dance on tv et cetera, et cetera, that yep. his mind was in good spirits at the time you know so she sat down and said yeah i enjoy watching bill dance too and they sat down and start watching the television program and he said you know i, I used to bass fish a lot also and said oh really where at you know i said predominantly mississippi and louisiana and he said I, at one time i I had the state record large, which he still does, but yeah. in his yeah. mind, he wasn't sure, you know, and right. uh, he said, Oh my gosh, you know, I'm making a breakthrough because to his zombie knowing this nurse had been trying to make contact with any of his family members for months and months and months. Yeah. So she left the room watching Bill dance, left the conversation with Anthony and got on social media and, and Google and, and tracked down his daughter back in Natchez, Mississippi, and wow. was able to, to put those two back in contact with each other. And uh, she got rekindled with her dad, you know, uh, six, eight months before he passed away. Oh, what, a, cool. what a fortunate circumstance. What a, what a great story. Yeah. Touching story. <laughs> yeah. Further, further proof, gentlemen, that Bill Dance makes everything better. Well, you know, yeah. I think Bill Dance uh, has no idea for how many odd things he is credited for. You know? <laughs> uh, I think all three of us can attest to things we've had happen in our life. Uh, it was because Bill Dance, you know, and he, uh, he uh, was Dance. Yeah, he wasn't even there, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I told you, both of you clowns, one time that uh, back during the when the war on terror was really raging, you know, a friend of mine who was a special forces guy, he and his, his platoon or his, his squad had captured two Taliban guys in Afghanistan and they had to march them down the mountain for two days, you know? And after about 12, 14 hours of this, one of the guys said, uh, man, I can't wait to get back to Tennessee and get back to bass fishing. And one of the Taliban, and they didn't know they spoke English because they they wouldn't speak to him, you know. And he said, "Oh, you you, you bass fish, you know Bill Dance." <laughs> and he said, "No, I don't know Bill Dance, but I know who Bill Dance is." And at that moment in time, those guys had something in common where they were not enemies, you know. Yeah. And that that meant a lot to both sides of the of the party, I'm sure. But yep. the guys, you know, the Taliban fighters didn't bass fish, but they watched the Bill Dance YouTube videos and the bloopers. So they had something in common for a moment, you know. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. Well, Terry, we should probably wrap this one up. Uh, do you want to yep. drive us home or you want me to take it? Go ahead and take it, Ken. All right, guys. First of all, Mike Davis, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. We can't cover Mississippi without Mike Davis. Mississippi Mike, Spooky Mike, Jiggy Mike. Iron Mike, all the nicknames we have for him. But now we're going to slam the door on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. Thank you, folks, for joining us. We know your time is valuable, and we really appreciate your spending some of it with us. If you enjoy the show, please hit the like and subscribe button. Send telegrams to your friends, notifying them of the fabulous Big Bass Podcast. If you really liked it, please share the show with your friends. Send a link and an email. Send it to about 30 to 35 people. It would help us a lot. If you're a Big Bass junkie, check out our website at thebigbasspodcast.com. You will find our Big Bass Podcast Calculator, created by none other 
than Dr. Terry J. Battisti. It's good for bass over about 14 and a half pounds. So you got to have your A game if you're going to start plugging numbers into the Big Bass Podcast yeah. calculator. But we also yeah. have a list of state record largemouth, smallmouth, and spotted bass there. If you'd like to contact us, you can reach us via email at ken at thebigbasspodcast.com, terry at thebigbasspodcast.com, or nathan at thebigbasspodcast.com. No need to email Mike Davis. If he needs you, he will find you because he's that good an investigator. <laughs> Meanwhile, please join us again next time when we will bring you another story about another big bass that you will not, that you cannot find anywhere else. And remember what, Terry Batisti? Size matters. There you go. <laughs> <laughs>